Coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. It was not easy for me. I, I struggled a lot. I struggled in pilot training. I struggled. I did good enough and I, and I got the job done, but it was always through effort and hard work and less like, oh, he's a great stick and he can fly an airplane really, really well. With, you know, it was more, I muscled my way into that. And I feel like that was something that I really valued about my time in the Air Force and something that was hard to let go of. That was Jason Shemchuk on his journey to flying the A-10 fighter jet in the Air Force. Fly fishing art, the A-10 warthog, and another fly fishing podcaster today on The Swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how are you doing today? Thank you for stopping by the show. You can find out if we have any slots left for the big Stillwater trip we got going right now with Phil Roy heading up to northern BC to the Northern Lights Lodge. This is going to be an epic trip. We just did the giveaway last week, and now we have some slots open. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash trips, T-R-I-P-S, to find out if uh, there's anything available. You can sign. Just enter your email, and we'll follow up with you with a call. Jason Shemchuk is here to share his story and the Wade Out There Fly Fishing Podcast. We discover and uh, find out which river he calls home, why he started this podcast, how being an Air Force fighter pilot shaped his life, and what we both have in common. So we got some good stuff in common here. This is a fun one with Jason. Definitely more than you'd think on this one. So uh, did I mention Jason used to fly an A-10 in the Air Force? This one is definitely above my pay grade. Here we go. Jason Shemchuk from wadeoutthere.com. How's it going, Jason? It's going great. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here and talk to you. I've listened to a bunch of your podcasts, and uh, I used to listen to some of your podcasts in preparation for some of the similar guests that we have, but I used to kind of get like, man, that was a really good podcast. Like, he asked a lot of the questions wow. I want to ask, so now I'm... <laughs> Now I stopped listening to the ones that you are similar guests because I, I'm like, I don't want to, uh, it puts me, I'm like, oh man, I always feel like I'm catching up. I, I love your podcast. Oh man, I appreciate that. No, that's, that's so cool to hear. I think it's, I can't remember what we'll talk about when you got started, but I, I was kind of the same way with some of the other podcasters out there. You know, I was listening to, uh, you know, April, I told her about that and same with uh, the Orvis, you know, I was like, Hey, this is. You know what I mean? You helped me get going. And that's kind of the cool thing. That's why I love doing these episodes right here, because it's just a chance to kind of connect the fly fishing podcast community. So we're going to get into the Wade Out There podcast and kind of all of that and, um, you know, a little on fishing. But maybe let's just start there. How did the Wade Out There? Just tell it, like, how did that thing come to be? Because I, I know you've been doing some fishing, but I know the podcast is a lot of work. Where'd that start? Uh, the podcast started in addition to the blog. So I started the blog when I separated, uh, when I stopped flying for the Air Force. So I was in the Air Force for a long time and I stopped flying. And when I stopped flying A-10s for the Air Force, I decided that I wanted to do something else that was, that I could be passionate about, that I could get into, that I could build into something that I thought was a meaningful work and uh, kind of a second career. So I started a blog because I've always liked to write. I had to go way back to before I was in the Air Force. I joined the Air Force when I was 18. And before I was in the Air Force, I was into creative writing and art. I was that kind of a student in high school. But I managed to squeak by into this kind of technical career field of flying airplanes. <laughs> and And I didn't really do much of that while I was in the air force, I did always try and get back to the mountains and back to the rivers that my father kind of introduced me to when I was doing that. But, you know, that was a part of me that was pretty far away. That was, you know, I hadn't touched in a long time in any deep, meaningful way. And so when I was done flying, I kind of was searching and that's where I landed. And so I started wanting to write books and novels and things, but I figured I'd start with a blog cause that seemed a little bit easier and uh, so I figured out how to build a website and then I started writing blog posts and then I figured out I started painting again. So I started and I figured out how to sell my art online and then kind of snowballed. And the concept when I started the blog, I was like, well, who's going to read the blog? You're not a guide. You're not an expert. What are you an expert in? My 
expertise became the person who's not an expert. And so I wrote, I wrote blog posts about, Hey, I'm just normal dude. This is some of the things that I've learned. And I started telling stories about my fly fishing experiences and what I learned from them. And that became fly fishing is special, but not elite because I had all these special memories from when I was a kid with my father and growing up and, you know, rivers in Montana and Colorado and stuff that were, you know, like I said before, far away from me and all these stories and lessons learned. And those are special to me, but I've always kind of been turned off by the idea uh, when I run into folks, which doesn't happen very often, but you know, we run into folks that are convinced that they have the, the monopoly on good ideas in fly fishing. So that was fly fishing is special, but not elite. And I started writing and then I figured there's gotta be other folks out there with that are experts that are more credible, that have similar stories and thought processes and, if I start a podcast, I can reach out to those people and share that idea with even more folks. So that's where the podcast came from. It's just kind of an extension of the ideas I tried to share in the blog. Right. Did you find, because I had a similar start with the blog first, did you find that, um, you know, the podcast really resonated with a lot more people you heard feedback versus the blog or were you getting out the blog too? Um, yeah, well, I learned pretty quick that my logic was flawed in that I thought, I also thought if I start the podcast, that it'll really help the blog, but it turns out people that listen to podcasts are not the same people that read blogs. So, <laughs> so that was, I mean, I didn't think about that, but it's totally obvious to me now. So now a lot of the energy goes into the podcast. I try and put a blog post out with kind of tied into each each episode as well, where I kind of share some of my ideas, reflections, I'll put quotes in from the guest or key takeaways. So I try and incorporate that into the blog as well, because I think some of my readers or subscribers kind of find that valuable as well. But, and then it's just a matter of finding the time to write the blog post and put that stuff out as well. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. No, that's cool. I, we had kind of a similar start here and, and how long, when did you launch the podcast? I've got one a week, put out 127 yesterday. So a couple of years, I guess. Yeah, over two. Yeah, you're going on your third year. Seems crazy to say that out loud, but I mean, I just kind of kept doing it. And, you know, I think it's, I don't know. I feel like maybe it's, a. I love to write and writing is kind of what I want to be doing in the art as well. Sometimes I look at the podcast as, Mm, I don't know if distraction is the right word, but it, it takes time away from some of the other things that I'm pursuing creatively, but I enjoy it. I love talking to people and I selfishly, I said this on the show, sometimes I learn so much. So I really feel like I'm progressing in a lot of different areas and learning about different species and different water types and things that, you know, I'm not able to go to all the time. And I think a lot of people in fly fishing have, have the similar kind of thing. And that's the person that I was writing to with Wade out there is the person that loves fly fishing. They want to progress. They want to get better. It's not about catching the most fish or the biggest fish. Although that is awesome. I, I love, <laughs> I'm not going to say I don't want to catch lots of fish or big fish, but it's more the person that shows up and they say, I want to learn. How can I take what I learned today on the river and bring it back on my own or you know what can i progress as in my fly fishing journey even though i got a wife and kids and i just got transferred down to houston and and you know that type of person that maybe they're not connected to fly fishing in a way that is as meaningful or as deliberate as it once was in their lives but you know they want to be a part of something and they don't want to be told that they don't have a special experience yeah exactly the one question I have, which is really interesting to me, this is why, again, the podcast is good because you mentioned the Air Force and A-10s, and I have no idea what that's like. So take us into the the cockpit of an A-10. What's that like? Because you were flying. You're literally, that's what your job was. Yeah, yeah. Yep. 14 years in the hog. So yeah, it was exciting, meaningful work. It was an airplane that provides a close air support mission to friendly troops on the ground in combat. And uh, does also combat search and rescue for downed airmen behind enemy lines, organizes and runs those operations. And then it does a forward air controlling role where it kind of uh, racks and stacks airplanes in the air and then 
brings them in at different intervals in different places to attack different targets. So that's kind of the three big mission sets of the A-10. It was something that I, when I was a kid, you know, I, I read a book in fifth or sixth grade called Warthog. And it was about A-10s in Desert Storm. And I had always wanted to fly airplanes. I was a kid that was in the library reading books. I read every book about fighter jets. I read, I was reading World War II ace books and I don't know where it came from. I have no idea. My parents never pushed it. My parents are not in the military. My grandfather was in World War II, but you know, that's most, a lot of people's story, you know, and he, I didn't see him that much because my family's from Jersey originally. And my dad moved to Montana when he was a kid. So when he was about 20, he moved to Montana and he lived there with my mom for, I don't know, five or six, seven years, maybe. And then there wasn't much work in the seventies for folks from out of town. So he moved to Washington. That's where they started a family. My, me and my brother were born there. Um, so this isn't really answering your question, I guess, but <laughs> no, it is. it is, but I, uh, so when I was a kid, that's my father, he had this deep connection with the mountains and, and rivers. And so he used to take me out to Montana. And so that was my life. And I don't really know, you know, I get, he used to take me to an airfield when I was really little, just to kind of get me out of the house. And we used to watch airplanes flying at this little FBO that's closed now. But my mom says my first word was airplane. I've just always mm. wanted to be flying airplanes. And then my father had a friend that was in the Vietnam war and he was a Thunderbird pilot. And just by chance they worked together in the insurance industry. And he told me that, you know, this is possible. You just need to work hard and keep grinding and you can do this. So, you know, I went to the air force Academy out of high school with the intention of hopefully flying a tens. And that was, and the more I learned about the mission, the more I learned about the job, the more that I knew that that was something that was going to, that that's what I wanted to do. And that it was more appealing to me than a high fast flyer, pointy nose kind of air to air game. The A-10 is all air to ground. So, I mean, I can go, I could talk yeah. forever about the A-10. I mean, I started flying it in Tucson. I've been stationed in Germany and Korea, Georgia. My last active duty assignment was at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. And then I joined the reserves out in Kansas City, Missouri. And I flew A-10s the whole time, multiple combat deployments, lots of all around the world type stuff. And... It just, I was in a lot of places. I've talked about this on the show where I could have gotten into fly fishing or done more things like striped bass or just bass or smallies or or a lot of those things. And I, and I didn't, I was pretty busy working. I mean, it was like a minimum 12 hour day kind of job, but I didn't because in my brain, it was always my father and me in the Rocky mountains. And, and so I was kind of prejudiced against any other kind of thing like fly fishing and that's something that's been great about the the podcast is talking to folks i realize how much bigger it is and so that's a message that i try to communicate in my writing and in the in the interviews is that you know we all have home water we all have a way to get out into nature and it might not be well i learned how to fly fish in colorado or idaho or montana but it doesn't have to be a river runs through it it can be a lot of other things. And I've talked to some pretty passionate anglers, you know, from all over the the place. And so I think that that's important as well. But as far as A-10s, I mean, I don't know what else you want to know about a- A-10s. That's it. Well, here's, let me give you a stupid question that I'll give you a, a better question. Okay. So how much is it like Top Gun, you know, you, the Top Gun movie stuff, right? You know, the whole movie thing. Is there any reality there? No. No. Not at all. Not really. I mean, I watched Top Gun when I was a kid. That was a big motivator for a lot of kids. Yeah. Were those A-10s? Were those A-10s they're flying? Maverick and all that stuff? No. Those are those are F-18 Hornets. Oh, yeah. F-18s, right. Yeah. How's the A-10? I see it. It's It's got two, the the rockets, you know, the stuff on top. How is it different from a the F-series? Uh, the A-10, so yeah, attack, airplane. It's all air to ground. So our only, our air to air game is all defensive. And our job is, it's got a big gun on the front and our job is to employ in close proximity to friendly forces on the ground. So it's not just to kill targets that are out there on the battle space. It's 
targets that are close to friendlies and that's what makes it close air support and that's what makes the a10 look the way that it does because the motors are built that way for self-defense and also for fuel efficiency the wings are straight like that because that gives it more lift and gives it more loiter time which lets it linger on the batter field longer uh the nose of the aircraft is built that way so that the pilot can see the battle space very well so he can look over the rail and see as much as possible it's also kind of that's where they house the gun which is the really precise weapon for close quarters that's why it is the way it is and it's got all kinds of redundant systems you know it's got multiple hydraulic systems and you know manual flight controls if all the hydraulics go out and it's got you know, self-sealing fuel tanks and all kinds of, all kinds of things that make it uh, survivable because its goal is to be in amongst it with, in the battlefield. So we work a lot with the army, Marines, Navy, special operations guys that are, that are doing the fighting. So that's where we go. Wow. Wow. Yeah. There's, I mean, again, obviously we're not going to talk uh, the whole episode about this, but it is interesting because you know, just like the gun, right? I mean, like what is the caliber of that thing is that like a 60 caliber thing or what is that a 50 it's a 30 millimeter yeah 30 millimeter yeah and it's got different you know it has an armor piercing incinerary round and high explosive incinerary round it has a combat mix of the two and it has um well it has a combat mix which is a mix of hei high explosive and armor piercing and then it has straight hei and then it has target practice rounds those just depend on the target which area of operations you're going to. Gotcha. And I just want to go down this route just for a second because we just had an episode. <laughs> okay. <laughs> episode 400. I don't know if you know Bo Beasley. Oh, congrats on 400, man. That's a, that's cool. Yeah, it was huge. And every episode, every 100 episodes, I try to do a big shout out to somebody huge in the industry, right? So I had Joan Wolf on. Okay. That was huge. And every 100 is something. And I was and I was and didn't really have one. And I wasn't thinking I had Bo on. And, and I didn't even know about it. But he wrote a book about project healing waters and it wasn't a book really about that but it was a book like 40 interviews with people combat veterans like from different wars and it was like all these stories and and like it was emotional he cried like like multiple times in the episode oh wow and i said bo this is so powerful i'm not a military i've never been but i just said hey this is so powerful could we do this because at the end he said literally like his best friend died because he committed suicide yeah because of ptsd and, uh, and he's like, this does, you know, I want to dedicate this to, you know, um, Mancini is, you know, and I was like, wow. And I asked him, could we use this as our 400th just to celebrate all the people that served? And, uh, and it was just a powerful episode. So I just, you know, thinking of you, right, because you served as well. I mean, is that is that something I'm sure you've seen it, but yourself, is that something that you kind of have dealt with the PTS? Is it seems like that's something maybe potentially everybody can be affected by a little bit. Um, I think there's maybe a sliver of truth to that statement. I think I'm very fortunate and lucky that I, you know, that I don't have a lot of those demons. I don't have a lot of uh, issues with that, but I do notice that one of the things, you know, so I talk to a lot of veterans on the show as well, because All right. there's a lot of people in the fly fishing industry and space. And, and my show is, is a little bit more geared towards people's journeys. Like if you want, like, the most expert advice on how to do something like you're going to get that sometimes, but I talk to people that are sometimes they're beginners or sometimes they are, they're not guides. Not everyone's a guide. Not everyone owns a fly shop. And so I do talk to a lot of veterans because what's important to me is that I'm talking to people that have a meaningful, special relationship with fly fishing and that they, that they love it. And I like to hear about why. And so I do talk to military guys and gals and uh yeah i agree there's i've had some episodes where people really credit fly fishing with a big chunk of their mental health and recovery and not just in military but other folks that are dealing with anxiety and things like that um cancer survivors you know with um, exactly that type of thing so yeah i've i've run into those people and it is definitely meaningful to be able to help share their stories usually they're associated with some sort of organization or they like to give a shout out to whatever organization has helped them and so that is meaningful but that happened on accident that was never an intention or the goal i just started talking to some folks and then you ask and then you talk to somebody 
and ask them, Hey, is there anybody else you think would be interested in talking? And then they, they put you on to somebody yeah. else that's in the military that has used fly fishing to heal as well. Um, yeah, those are meaningful conversations for me because, you know, my goal in the A-10 as a close air support pilot and our goal as a squadron or unit or a community was always, the, you know, the soldier on the ground and bringing them back, you know, keep them alive. And I mean, when you dedicate 14 years of your life, like every day that, I mean, it was wow. part of who I was and I was in it deep and I loved it. And, you know, I really that's why I wanted to keep doing what I was doing. And so when guys come back and, you know, and then they kill themselves, you know, the suicide rates and all those things that is discouraging, you know, because not just us, but the, but the folks on the ground, everybody's working hard over there to get the mission done and to get home to their families and loved ones. And, and so when you, you know, when you dedicate so much of your life and so much time and energy into that cause and then to see it slip away because of these other mental health issues that are driving suicide rates, that becomes discouraging for sure. And, um, it's something that I don't think about a lot, but I do, yeah. I do, I'm aware of it and I think about it. And, and a lot of times talking to some of these veterans on the show, is a big reminder of that. And, um, so I do, I find that meaningful work in the podcast, but I don't personally have, you know, like I said, I don't have real demons or, or things, you know, <laughs> that I'm aware of, right. you know, I, yeah, exactly. I've probably, I've been skewed a little bit with my background. I mean, I surely changed my personality a little bit, some for the good, some for the bad. But one thing that I will say though, that I think is universal with folks is that, well, maybe not universal, but if you, I didn't know this when I started getting into more of the fly fishing kind of a second career for me, but you know, the fly fishing community is, is a wonderful community to be a part of. There's awesome people, super friendly, super helpful. You know, I, I say fly fishing is special, but not elite, but I don't run into a ton of like elite elitist kind of snobby people. That's not, that's not the view I have of, of fly fishing. And I think that that is super useful as well. Even, I don't know equally, but you know, useful for a veteran or somebody who's needs healing to be able to go and be a part of a community. Because I think what's lost a lot of times is maybe you didn't see something that was totally distressful or, or you weren't involved in some sort of like terrible combat experience or, or nightmares of bombs and things like that. Maybe that's not your story, but maybe you joined the army when you were 18 and all your friends were in the army and you had this job in the army that meant a lot to you. And you had this meaningful, purposeful life with a community of people around you. When you leave the military for whatever reason, those people are gone a lot of times, especially, you know, if you're hometown kid and you go back and now you're back hometown and all those people are in Germany and Korea and Georgia and all over the world and you're, they're not with you anymore. And so I think that it's, worth examining the value of being a part of not just fly fishing, but any community for somebody who is struggling with kind of the exit from the military. And, um, it's not, right. you know, just the healing of the casting or being in the water and nature and all that is really good. And I think there's a lot of science that will back up like the value of being in nature, especially water. And that's why these organizations like project healing waters or, um, iron freedom foundation, you know, these organizations exist because that is, you know, proven to be valuable. But I also think being part of the community is important and being able to call somebody or go to a fly tying class or be part of Trout Unlimited together or just be on the river together. You know, you have somebody that's, you know, with you that you can relate to. And if you throw that there are a veteran in there as well, now that's even better because now they kind of can understand where you came from. Mm, nice. And now you are pretty much out of the uh, the Air Force. Are you pretty much out fully? Pretty much. You know, I've recently got to 20. Um, I haven't been flying for the Air Force for a few years. And um, I, yeah, so I fly commercially. And Oh, you do? Yeah, I work on, um, wait out there, I work on my art and, and this try and build this kind of side hustle into a second career is my goal. There you go. 
my smarter question from the back there, <laughs> which is still kind of a stupid one, I think, but so the A10 are, you know, taking off in that landing and that versus the just a regular, you know, airline 747, any comparison there? No, it's not really the same kind of line of work, but it's, it's fine. Yeah, it's totally different. All right. And uh, well, let's jump into a little bit on, so you're in Utah now. In Utah, what is, uh, you know, fishing wise, I, I mean, have you been there a little while? I can't remember how long have you been in Utah? Yeah. So we moved here about a year and a half ago, almost exactly a year and a half ago. And part of the move was so that I could make this kind of second life a reality. I mean, we were in Kansas City, Missouri, and the suburbs there. And that was our last kind of flying assignment. And when I stopped flying out there, like I said, I was looking for something more meaningful. And I got back into art and writing and in the fly fishing space because fly fishing, if I could do one thing every day, you know, I'd, I'd go out on the river. I love moving on a river. I love just being out on the river. And I've always felt that way. And we don't have a lot of that. We have a lot of awesome things in Kansas city. Missouri is a beautiful state. I love the Midwest. I love Midwesterners. I mean, I really, really enjoyed it. I could have got, could have got deep into the white river system and the Ozarks and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I went down there yeah. a little bit when I was out there, but you know, it's a three and a half hour drive. I got little kids, you know, it's a whole day. It just is not convenient. And for this season of our life, I felt, and my wife felt like we've always kind of wanted to be in the mountains. My wife's from Colorado. I spent time in Montana and Colorado. So mountains for us was the goal. We just took a kind of 15 year, like <laughs> yeah. detour with the air force, but we had this opportunity and we could raise our kids in the outdoors. My kids are outside like all day, a year round, you know, they're either skiing or fishing or hiking or biking or, you know, that it was important for us to have our children in the outdoors. Because when I look back on my childhood and I see like all my memories and all the good things, a lot of it was the mountains and the rivers and things. And so for us, it was like, well, why don't we double down on that? Let's just give them more of that, you know? So we moved out here for that. And then also for me to be close to, an art scene where people want to, you know, look at fly fishing art or they want to, you know, I'm close to fly shops and art shows and things like that. And then I'm also, I can get to Bozeman and Jackson hole and park city and places like that are close to me. And then the fishing's great. I mean, it's Utah and it's awesome. And, uh, it's been great. It's been cool being able to go for a couple hours, you know, and not make a whole production out of it. It doesn't have to be a whole day where I have to drive three hours to get someplace. I can, you know, if I have three hours, I can go, I can just drive and get a couple hours on the river and, and come home and, and still be present as a father and a husband, which is kind of my number one priority. Mm -hmm. What is your, do you have a, you know, kind of now your year and a half there, like kind of your home water there? Is there, I mean, there's a few big ones, right? A few big streams there. Yeah, the big ones out here, um, the green is probably the big, you know, that's the big one. But that one's still pretty far out. So, yeah, I've got a bunch of local streams around here that I fish that are close, you know, small streams. There's lots of stuff, lots of small stream fishing, all, all sorts of stuff there. Yeah, and I haven't even explored a lot of it. I, every time I have a guest on from Utah, I'm always like, <laughs> you right. know, this is great. Yep. And uh, so that's been exciting as well. And I'm really looking forward to trying to, you know, get more into the community start showing up at some of the local expos and, and, um, and doing some more face-to-face -face interviews with folks that are in the local area and, and, uh, being part of some of the organizations, um, you know, casting for recovery has a big chapter out here and there's some uh, veteran organizations that, that take gold star families out that I'm looking forward to becoming a part of. So yeah, it's been, dream come true for me. You know, when I, when I was a kid, you know, I was almost, I was thinking about going to Montana state. That was like, that was where I was planning to go. And I, it was to do all these types of things to write and paint and be in the woods and fish. And, you know, I just took a different path and I don't have any regrets, but I feel like I'm come back to a, a place that's kind of reminds me of about a, a part of myself that, it feels good to be in that, you know, to have kind of been true to myself and say, yeah, I, I am going to go back to that. And that is important to me. And I just lucky, fortunate that my wife is so supportive and, and adventurous as well. Cause we loved the Midwest and it was, it was tough to move, but we're glad we did. 
Right. Right. Yeah. The Midwest is awesome. What's the, I always think, you know, we talked about this going pro, you know, if you were to go pro and I always think about the, um, the war of art, a book that I've, I've loved. I always I love that, that book. Know, yeah. Started. Yeah. You know it, you know it. Yeah. Stephen Pressfield. But, uh, so you got writing, you got art, you got podcasting. If you had to choose one to go pro in fully, that's the only one you could do. Which one is it? Art. Oh, it is art. Yeah. I mean, maybe writing, but you know, I think my art is something that I, I really feel like I can progress at that and get to a place in another 10 years or 15 years. It's something that I, you know, I'm excited about switching to oils here soon and really putting a lot of energy into that. So the move to Utah took a lot of energy, time and money. And, uh, the transition has been, you know, it's taken a lot of, like I said, time and energy away from a lot of my efforts, you know, at weight out there for sure. But I feel like it's a little bit of one step backwards for 10 step forwards type thing. Like this is a strategic kind of move for me to be in this place. And it was the right move, but there's definitely been an adjustment period. I don't know. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah, yeah, it does. No, I mean, some of it's for me, it's a little, um, just the art itself is abstract. I mean, I have like family, my, my grandma was a pretty awesome artist. I'm looking at a painting right now on the wall of her, like it's an abstract oil and uh, maybe I'll throw a thing in the show notes to show what it looks like. But it's, uh, it's pretty amazing because I never had the art. I mean, right. I never, and I don't know if it's more like I just didn't ever put the time in or I just wasn't interested, but I mean, looking at your art, do you feel like it's something that you've, you've just been getting better or did you just have art in you from day one? I think I have a, a certain amount of ability, you know, but it's not, I'm not gifted by any means. It's not like, holy smokes, man, this guy is an artist. Wow. But I have enough to where I feel like I can build upon it. And one of the special things about my time in the air force was, you know, that was a similar journey for me is when I started out, it was not easy for me. I, I struggled a lot. I struggled in pilot training. I struggled. I did good enough and I got the job done, but it was always through effort and hard work and less like, oh, he's a great stick and he can fly an airplane right? really, really well. You know, it was more, I muscled my way into that. And I feel like that was something that I really valued about my time in the Air Force and something that was hard to let go of because- you know, when you work that hard and struggle and fail rides and hook rides and, you know, and keep coming back for, and through all the upgrades and stuff, you get to the end and now you're not struggling. Now you're teaching guys and helping guys and you're able to say, Hey, listen, you know, I was where you are. Like you're, it's going to be okay. You're going to, you're going to figure this out. And I loved that about teaching in the A-10 and so when I talk to guys and gals in the fly fishing industry that I see that are also teachers and not just guys, but real mentors or real teachers, that's exciting for me because I think that's valuable and doesn't come on accident. And the ones that I think are really good know most about it because they've learned the hard way. Yeah, no, that's, that's well, but I always think earlier when you're talking about that, the fact that you did that and you were a pilot and you, you know, put your time in. It's kind of a reminder for the kids. I always think of like the kids out there, you know, listening, you know, my kids, your kids, they're like, wow, that's a good example of like putting your mind to it. And you know what? You can do anything. Like I you know, say that to my kids, like you can literally do anything. We're in this one of the countries where you can do that. Right. Do you believe that you can kind of be whatever you want? I believe that we live in a great country. I believe that you can achieve a lot of things. I think the requirement is work and that I think that is a message that sometimes it's left out. I think, you know, I push hard work with my kids, not because I want them to like make a lot of money, but just because I think that they will take so much joy out of life on the backside of work and everything that I look at in my life that has been meaningful and has brought real joy to my wife and I has come on hardship and hard work. I mean, even, you know, our daughter had some medical things that you know she's good now, but that experience has given us so much this perspective, you know, the fact that she's with us and, you know, alive and my wife and I will say, you know, I, I almost am grateful for that experience because it was so hard, but 
it made us close and, and it gave us perspective and life is better now because of that experience. And I think people like to look at the opportunities in the country and say, well, I can do this and that and everything. And that's true. And that's why I love to, to give that message to my children is similar to you, right? You can do anything you want, but you better be ready to work, man, because these guys, I mean, I don't, you know, I think a lot of times too, art and art forms kind of get this bad rap, like how are you going to make a life as a fly fishing person, right? What are you going to be a guide? Guys don't make that much money, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to be an artist and a guide, or maybe I'm going to start a podcast or maybe I'm, you know, doing what you do, you know, create your own thing. Yeah. Create your own stuff. And that's all possible, but you know, you gotta, <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to yeah. sound like, no, go for I, it. <laughs> I'm not militant about it. I just, I just really think that, um, that that's important and it's not, yeah, you know, just have to kind of put in the time and keep going. And it's something that I've, I love that about my time in the air force. And so, I'm excited about it with my art. I'm excited about it with weight out there. I'm excited about it with the podcast, like all these things, you know, you have good days and bad days where you're like, man, is this going to take off or is anyone ever going to really buy this art or, you know, like, is this going to be the thing? But I remember those ideas and feelings in the jet. I remember being like, dude, are you ever going to upgrade? I mean, you're, you know, like this is maybe you should just stop. <laughs> you know maybe you should just give up you know that's the you know the war of art you know again going back to that book that's what i loved about that book is that you know that was the message the message was you know what yeah. you're gonna fall on your face and you know to be successful you got to get up like he did the marine analogy yeah. he was like you got to be like a marine you got to be able to just get up yeah. and show up every day and it, you know what i mean resistance you gotta resistance yeah you're battling re- that thing in your head telling you you suck yeah you can't, you're not good enough, right? You got to battle everyday resistance. That book really did resonate with me. And I, I think it's great. I think it's funny that he's not that kind of a book writer. You know, he's a, he writes novels and, you know, Gates of Fire. Yeah. The War of Bagger, War of Bagger Vance. The Legend of Bagger Vance. The yeah, Legend yeah. of Bagger. The yeah. Legend of Bagger Vance, Gates of Fire, which about Thermopylae. That's a great one. Oh, wow. That one's yeah. about, it's kind of what the movie 300 was loosely kind of based on that construct of the oh, book. Okay. But, that's another really great book, but he wrote these other books, like he said, because he felt like he kind of had to write them because he had these ideas and, and holy smokes, I'm glad he did. They're really good ideas. Yeah. yeah. No, it's good. Nice. Well, let's see, where are we at here? We got, you know, this is what, you know, again, this is what's pretty awesome is that we've kind of gone down the road, haven't talked about fishing yet, but really, I mean, I mean, for you, well, let's just go down that a little bit. I mean, I wanted to ask you about, I know still water fishing is something we're interested in. Do you do, I know Utah has some still water fishing. Is that something of interest to you or is it more rivers? More rivers. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface of my time out here, both fishing and hunting, but I'm going to go to the river every time. I just, I like being on a river. Even if I'm just not fishing, I'd like to go out there. And when I go with my kids, you know, that's what I enjoy is playing on the river with my son. My daughter is a little too small to kind of be quite as adventurous but we do take her to some small streams and stuff in the summertime but yeah rivers for sure we've got you know the weber river is close to my house and um some other small streams and i get up to the provo once in a while i've been on the green a few times so um but i try and stay close to home because i want to kind of maximize my time i have a fishing buddy we talk about this all the time it's like why would I drive all that way when I could be fishing that time, you know? And I think there's truth to that, but I also think it's valuable to kind of go different places sometimes, even if it's on the same river. Like I can go to a spot close to my house where I I'm confident. I feel like I know this area. I know kind of the way the river is in this, just this one little section and I can catch fish typically, typically, you know, but, uh, but sometimes I just have to muscle through and be like, you know what, you're going to drive up and fish this other section and it's not that much further. And you know, you're going to, and that's what I've enjoyed too, is learning to learning a new river, I think is exciting for me, especially as somebody who has always, not always, but usually traveled a lot, traveled even via long drive to get someplace to have something that's, you know, I don't have to learn the river in three or four days. I can kind of learn seasons and more about the, 
yeah. entomology and more about the flows and the you know the dams and how they operate and how they work and change the fishing and that's been really exciting right yeah everything do you have are you more like dry flies nymphs what's your go-to there i just want to catch fish so i i do it all i am not a great streamer fisherman i've said this before but i i fish streamers more often now than i did before which is still not to say i fish them a lot but i will fish streamers i think the reason i don't fish streamers as much is a i'm not as you know proficient at it i just don't know as much about it but also you know a lot of people will say that they don't catch as many fish with streamers and um, but that's okay for them because they like the excitement of the aggressive takes and the bigger fish and all that stuff and um i don't know it doesn't motivate me as much as catching catching fish so sometimes i feel like that but i think i'd rather catch a bunch of little fish than like search right. out the monster with a streamer but i don't know i mean you can catch bunches of fish with streamers too probably uh, yeah yeah i'm sure you can once you get you know if you get it dialed in i'm not dialed in i will say that with the streamers yeah no me neither but i'll do dry flies or nymphing or all that stuff and I, i'm experimenting a little bit with tight lining and um whatever yeah the euro euro tight lining mono whatever you want to call it yeah yeah all that stuff I, and uh i'll do whatever i i like uh any of those things I'll fish nymphs most of the time until I have a reason to fish dries and then. Right. Until you see something going on. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. That's good. What's your local, uh, fly shop. You got somebody there. Uh, angler's den is down in, oh, yeah. um, Roy, uh, which is kind of on the other side of Ogden. So I live up the hill from Ogden in the mountains there by, uh, snow basin ski resort. We kind of live close oh, wow. to that area. So I go to angler's den quite a bit. They're super nice, super friendly down there they're kind of more than just a fly shop. They have some, uh, gear stuff in there as well and lake fishing stuff. And I've found them to be super friendly and nice. And, um, I'm looking forward to hanging some of my art up in their shop. <laughs> mm, nice. There and, you go. um, yeah, they're good folks down there. And then there's one up in, um, Heber city too. fish heads is another one. They've been pretty nice. I don't go up there quite as often because it's a little bit further, but I've talked to a few folks. Uh, well, at least I've talked to one gal who's up there and guides for them. She's super friendly and nice, and uh, um, they've been great as well. Nice. What is your, uh, you know, on your art, uh, just going back to that for a sec here, you know, can you just describe it for like those that haven't seen it? Yeah, sure. I'm a watercolor artist now, and excited to be switching to oils soon i have a couple series that i'm working on in watercolor that i want to finish before i kind of move on to oils and that's because i feel like i still have a little bit to learn from watercolors probably still have a lot to learn but the things that i want to learn from watercolors i'm still exploring and then i also kind of want to finish what i started so when i say I'm, i've got a series and i've got these types of paintings that i want to do i want to finish those out so I've got those to finish and then I paint fish and I paint fly fishing scenes. Um, I think someday I'll probably move beyond and fish other or uh, <laughs> paint other things, but it's a fly fishing kind of themed art work and um, it's kind of quasi realism. You know, I don't focus on making it look exactly like the photograph or the picture. That's not my goal. Um, I found that that was, it was easier for me to kind of explore my art when I started to realize that it didn't have to, you know, it's art. It's, it's not, a, yeah. it's not a, like my dad told me, he's like, Jason, it's art. It's not a photograph. Like, yeah, it's not the same thing, man. Like go look at some art books, you know, read some history and art is different for everybody. And that's been cool to discover as well. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm looking at some of them now on your website. It's really cool. That's, that's the sweet thing about like watercolors. Like how do you, you know, watercolors versus oil, you know, why would you switch? These look so awesome. Why switch to, to the other form? Well, I think I'm excited about, you know, watercolor is tricky. You know, watercolor is tricky because watercolor is translucent. So your lighter colors 
once you put the dark down, you can't go backwards. I mean, there's, there's some things you can do to go backwards, but not really. I mean, you can wet it and blot it and kind of pick up some of the pigment, but really if you want white on your paper, you've got to leave that there. And so you build around the white. And so you start light and go dark kind of. Oh, right. And so that's watercolor. And, and I like that about it. I find that the way that I paint with watercolors is a little less um, loose than a lot of watercolor painters, you know, and the, a lot of my work is starting the more I practice at it. You asked me if I've seen progress and I can, definitely say that when i started i was like holy smokes this is not this is not the best jason but right they're different I, I see progress and that's encouraging in the watercolor and so i don't know i just want to progress into something different i want to start painting bigger i've been painting bigger watercolors my latest series is trout expressions and so those are 18 by 24s and i think getting into oils and painting bigger. I think painting bigger with oils is a little bit easier. I don't know, maybe not easier, but just seems like more natural for me to paint a bigger painting with, with oil paintings or uh, oil paint. Um, I'm kind of excited about trying a new medium and I'm excited about what my style will kind of look like in oil versus watercolor versus, you know, what I'm kind of thinking that it might be and discovering that because that's been a unique process in watercolor as well as kind of figuring out, Oh, this is kind of how you paint your fish, Jason, you know, like, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly why, but I just want to kind of move on to, to this oil thing. And I, what I'm really excited, even more than oil is painting bigger. Like I feel like that's been super liberating because I've always kind of painted watercolors on a smaller scale in this last series has been really cool to paint something bigger and I just more color, more bigger brushes. I just feel like as constrained. I don't feel like as tight, like I'm, you know, with little brushes and small strokes and stuff like that. I like, I like bigger brushes, less strokes, more freedom. That's cool. And it's been nice being out in Utah. When I started painting, I was in the basement storage room. So when we came out here, I got a little, Got a little art studio slash podcast room. Oh, nice! There you go. Bought one of those uh, one of those roll top desks for my fly tying stuff. Found it on Facebook Marketplace for like hundred bucks. I can't believe the deal I got on it, but wow! Got my fly tying stuff over there, and uh, yeah, I'm excited. You're good to go. You're good to go. You got your art space essentially. Yeah, writing, arting, <laughs> even podcasting is art, right? Yeah, I'm looking at my paints right now as I talk to you, dude. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's no, fun. It sounds like, and these these definitely are good. I'll put some of these in the show notes. Maybe we'll grab a couple. Oh, well, I appreciate that, man. I would like to say one thing that I thought was ironic is when I started the podcast. Like I said, I don't talk to just guides and stuff like that, or or, but I talked to uh, Ad Maddox one time, and she's a fly fishing artist as well. She's out in Livingston, Montana, and she has been super helpful. And she's a tremendous artist and someone kind of has become a fly fishing or a, an art mentor for me. And I think one of the things that she taught me, we talked a lot so far about my air force stuff and flying. I didn't know we were going to talk about all that, but, <laughs> but, uh, she really gave me permission to lean into that part of my personality and my art. And that has been huge. And even if I only started the podcast just to have a couple of those conversations with her about my specific art, it would have been worth it because it has really changed the way that I approach my art. Whereas before I thought, well, you need to be like, I have a preconceived idea of what an artist is in my brain. It's this, you know, kind of more left, left brained, kind of more fuzzy, more kind of, and she really told me no man you need to lean into the other parts of you that you you know the parts of you that made you uh have success in the a10 and in the air force and stuff like those are the, the same types of things that'll help you in art with being persistent right. and overcoming obstacles and working hard and like all that stuff you know is going to get you to progress you know that's the work that it takes like in the war of art that's the stuff that matters more than the talent I think, and I certainly think, you know, in my time in the Air Force, I saw that a hundred, uh, many, many times you see folks that 
they're the ones that work the hardest that kind of have, they end up really moving far, I guess. Mm-hmm. So that 80, it was 80 Maddox? AD Maddox, yeah. AD Maddox, yeah. We'll put that, if we get that episode throughout in the show notes as well. Sure, yeah. She's a great lady and super friendly and i know she's helped other artists too but certainly she's been really helpful for me and uh i think we talk on the show a lot about art and how she kind of approaches art it's not the fishiest show but we do talk a little fishing too i think right yeah yeah just like this one we've talked a little (laughs) bit (laughs) i'm happy to talk fishing i mean i'd love to talk fishing i talk about it all the time but yeah well the cool thing is, is we got Utah. We've done, you know, I've had all the the fly fish food guys on, you know what I mean? Like we've done, I've had a number of Utah episodes, so we've got plenty of content there that, that covers. I'm not worried about not digging in today. Okay. But yeah, I mean, all this stuff is super interesting. I mean, the, I guess let's just keep on that podcasting track a little bit as far as what you have going here. I mean, as you're looking out, you know, you've got 127 episodes looking ahead. Is it just kind of keep the same thing rolling along? You got more podcast episodes or you got any ideas how you're going to kind of tweak things as you go? Well, yes, I have aspirations to do more face-to-face episodes and to turn Wade out there into more of a adventure home, like a, a place where I share my fly fishing adventures with people. And that would include probably video and a face-to-face interview and art and stories from my kind of journeys as I branch out from Utah and kind of hub and spoke it up to different areas and, you know, and go fishing with some of the people that I have on the show. And so I'd like to at least partially turn the podcast into that type of medium where you could listen to the podcast, you could watch a video about the area, you could, um, you know, you could see some paintings of the fish or the species from that area. You could read a blog post or read an article that I wrote about what makes that place special or some of the lessons I learned while I was out there. So that is, that's the next kind of what I'm trying to do, but I've got time and space, so that's good. But, you know, I need, I need to reach a little bit more of a tipping point before I can dive that deep into it. You know, Stephen Pressville wouldn't be happy. He'd say, you need to quit your job and you need to go right <laughs> to go pro now. Uh, and he'd be right. He's probably right, but I'm easing into it a little bit. I think Utah was a big step for me. So I, I'm going to give myself a little win on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Year and a half is nothing. You're still, yeah, you just arrived. That's a year and a half there. That's not too long, but yeah, that's what I'm excited about. And, and really, blending some of the art more with the the podcast and the places that I go and, and people I talk to and uh, video as well. I'm, I'm really excited. I have some folks that I'm, I've talked to a little bit about working video into it and so they can edit some of my film and stuff like that and, and put some of that out because I've thought when I was planning fly fishing trips or thinking about different areas I like the concept that you can go and kind of listen to a conversation like you have on your podcast and get information that way and then see an area through the eyes of somebody that believes the same thing you believe. So if you like wait out there and you like the message and you like kind of the the idea, then it would make sense that you would go there to to listen to the same types of folks talk about things that you care about and areas that you want to go to. Mm-hmm. Nice. Well, let's uh, let's take it out of here in a second. Here, I've been trying to do the uh, the two minute drill. We're calling it here just to force me to kind of <laughs> you know wrap things up. It's pretty funny, but let's let's jump into this real quick. I had a couple of rapid fire questions for you. All right, and we'll see how well we can do here. And uh, well, and actually, before I get there, I got one that's not as rapid fire. I always love the podcasting. Do you listen to podcasts? Do you listen to a lot of other podcasts? No, <laughs> no, you don't. No, I don't listen to a lot of podcasts. I, you know, I, I started to listen to some of them because I was, like I said in the beginning, you know, I, the one you did with Dominic Swintowski from Trout yeah. Bitten, I had Dominic on the show. I've had him on twice now, but the first one I did, I was really excited because he really influenced me as a, with the blog that I was writing. I really liked Trout Bitten, the his writing style and stuff. And he, had answered a lot of questions for me when I was starting out with the website and the blog and helped me kind of just through social media or whatever. 
And then when he started his podcast, I got an opportunity to kind of help him a, a little bit, not to the same extent, but all to say, I was excited to be talking to him. So I listened to your interview with him and I was like, ah, dang it. <laughs> that was a great interview, Dave. So, Oh, thanks. No, I appreciate that. It was, yeah, he nailed it. I mean, that, that was, was a great one. I always find in the interviews, the, the less talking I do, you know, it usually is better, <laughs> right? Because it got these yeah. people on and stuff like that. So less editing too. <laughs> yeah. It, well, in editing, that's the one thing. Yeah. We do have great editors on this too. And they're clean and just like today, you know, there's some stumbles I've had today and that'll get cleaned up probably a little yeah. bit. Good. So, well, let's jump on this. So the two minute drill, this is just some random questions here. And some of these came, I just had a recent one that was talking about rods, right? So this is the, the thing you can have. So the one rod, so you can only pick one weight length. What is the rod? I put five weight. Yeah, that's it. That's not because I'm a uh, expert in any kind of rod ideas, but I just, I don't need anything more than that for what I do based on my skill sets as a fly fisher. And I'm a trout fisherman and I don't fish big water a lot. Right. Exactly. Yeah. The big water. I was just thinking, cause I use a lot of six weights, but I was thinking it seems like there's a school of thought or not even a school of thought, but like a four weight, a six weight, eight weight, 10 weight, or a five a seven, a nine, <laughs> right? Yeah. So you're probably in the five, seven, nine. I have a, um, or you mean as far as the weight? Yeah. Well, yeah, just wait. Like if you had to pick three rods, let's say you pick oh, three, three rods, rods, is it a five, seven, nine, or is it a six, eight, ten, or four, six, ten? I have a four, I have a 10 foot four weight that I picked up for tight lining. And that's been nice. I don't think you need a 10 foot rod to do tight lining. I think you know, I think it's more useful for reach and getting different places. It just depends on the size of the river that you're fishing. So, but I, I do like the 10 foot four weight and nine foot five weight. And then probably, uh, I don't know. That's really all I need. I mean, if I was, if I was going to go, if I was going to get more into streamer fishing, maybe a six weight. Yeah. You know, to throw some bigger flies or if i was on bigger water maybe six weight but yep. i'd love to get it i'd love to tell you that the answer is an eight weight and that i'm going saltwater fishing next month but that's down the road but i'd love to get deep into that world but i feel lucky that i've got you know this weight out there platform to kind of momentum kind of carries you and i mean i don't know what your take is on it and i'm interested in your opinion but man it's been an awesome and like the, the snowball builds, you know? Yeah. I start a website, I got a blog and it's like, maybe I'll do a podcast. Maybe I should start painting again. And you know, when I started the podcast, I was at zero, you know, <laughs> zero listeners. And that's why it's exciting to talk to you today, Dave, because yeah. like, uh, when I was starting a podcast, I was like Googling, all right, what, fly fishing podcast, what's out there? What do we got? We got uh, <laughs> Tom and we got Dave and we got a couple other guys. So it was really cool that you asked me to be on the show. I'm super grateful. Yeah, for sure. No, it's been a good journey for us too. And I'm the same with you. I'm looking out like, oh, wow. Okay. We can, there's a lot of saltwater stuff we you know haven't done, but I'm kind of staying the same thing, focusing on trout at least for some of the trips we're doing because it's a little bit easier and I love trout fishing anyways. And so we're doing that. Um, well, so let's just stay on that trip. So your trip, you've had all these guests on, is there one trip, you know, you're just thinking like, this is probably the next big one I really need to go on. You mean fly fishing trip? Yeah. Well, the next trip that I really need to go on, (laughs) I don't get emotional, but my is with my father and my brother and, I've talked about it on the show and I wrote a couple of posts about this, but we do a fly fishing. We do a, a rendezvous, a Shemchuk rendezvous once or twice a year with my brother and my dad. And that's mostly because when I was in the air force, I didn't get to spend a ton of time with my family. So when I got out of the active duty and joined the reserves and kind of started, you know, going into this fly fishing space or community or whatever I'm doing at wait out there, whatever it is, I, I started, you know, we kind of made a, a pact or a, a plan to do one or two fly fishing adventures oh, nice. every year. It doesn't nice. have to be fly fishing. We've gone like hunting a couple times and stuff, but leans into fly fishing because of where I'm at. But yeah, so my father had heart surgery last March um, and he's good and strong and, uh, but we haven't had a rendezvous in a while and this one has to happen. So my son is coming 
for the first time. That'll be cool. Oh, wow. So grandpa is excited. I'm excited. My son is excited and my brother's excited. So that's the next, that's the next trip that has to happen. You know, uh, we're going up to Montana, fish the big hole. Oh, you're hitting the big hole. We just did a big hole episode with uh, Wade Fellin up there. Oh, cool. The whole lodge. Yeah. At which lodge? Uh, it's a big hole, the big hole lodge. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wade Fellin. Yeah. He told a cool story about, um, well, we've had some connections through him, but yeah, I can't remember that. Well, the Mother's Day hatch was one he talked about as a real big one they love there. Yeah. We went out trying to hit the last time we were there. We, you know, I'm ever the elusive salmon fly hatch for me. I just can never really yeah. hit it right. And so we were trying to do that, but we got into great dry fly fishing on PMDs and then nymphed a bunch. Oh, cool. My brother has a drift boat, so we take his. And, you know, my dad likes to row. He'll row all day. Oh, wow. And uh, my brother and I will fish and cool wow so you got some skills yeah your dad and your brother they've got some they got the boating they must have some skills out in the space uh, or in just fly fishing and yeah i don't know i don't know if <laughs> <laughs> they got him if he's got a boat if he's got his own drift boat that's pretty big we have a boat i don't know if boat equals skills but <laughs> <laughs> i know a lot of people that would not be able to row uh you know i mean i know there's a lot of people that couldn't row a drift boat down the river safely right i mean that's a skill well He's a 70 year old man and, uh, he's going to do it. So he's, like I said, he's really strong and, uh, he just had a, a valve on his heart that was faulty, I guess. And it was, it was pretty scary. Um, so that's the next one that has to happen as far as like wait out there. I try not to like, I've tried to not, when we do rendezvous, I try not to, you know, mix the two. Like I don't go off for a day and meet with somebody or those are just special times with our family. So other than taking pictures and things. And I definitely get ideas and write blog posts about it. But while we're there, I try and make that about being there. Uh, I went out to Pennsylvania. That was pretty cool. The next big one. Uh, I don't know. I don't have a next big one. Yeah. Well, the one with your family sounds pretty big. To me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's going to be cool. Yeah. Good deal. What about, uh, give us your one fly. So you, you got a special, uh, pattern, nymph, whatever that you just seem to be like, it's the one you've always got in your box. <laughs> um, it's gotta be one, huh? I like these types of questions. Yeah. It's just one. Yeah. That's the thing. It's the two minute drill <laughs> We're over two minutes, but it's just one orange scud. Oh, the scud. Yeah. There you go. It just, I catch a ton of fish on it. And if I am going to be fishing around here, I want the orange scud. There's, a lot of tailwaters the weavers of tailwater in a lot of sections exactly yeah we used to tie a scud an orange scud that had a we i just trim the uh, plastic off of a plastic bag and use that as the shell nice do you tie flies too or yeah i tie flies a slightly below average fly tire so i can tie the flies i can tie my confidence flies if i can't tie it then it's not my confidence fly and that's i kind of try and stick to those and i try and not have too many and then when i go on a trip I might look ahead and tie some flies that are within my confidence fly range of skills and abilities that would fit into that fishery. And then when I show up, I go to the fly shop and say, Hey, you know, I'm here with my brother. I'm here with my dad, my brother, and uh, we're going to be fishing a little bit. We got a drift boat. We want to pick up some leaders and some flies. And can you share anything about where the fishing, where the fish are or what water types are in and any flies that you'd recommend? Mm-hmm. Perfect. What about somebody listening here that uh, may be thinking about starting a podcast? What sort of tip or advice would you give that person? Just start. You just got to go. Just get to get started. And you're never going to know how to do it until you start. This It's not, you cannot know how to do it until you start. And so if you don't start, you won't do it, I guess, if that makes sense. I mean, yep. it was. Uh, Is that how you jumped into it? You just kind of just taught yourself? Well, yeah, for sure. I think what was helpful is, you know, you buy a microphone. For me, if I spend money on something, that's a that means I care about it. Like I'm I bought a microphone. All right. Well, that's that makes it real. And then just like baby steps. I remember like the microphone sat in my house for a week or two and I'm like, "All right, dude. Well, plug this thing in and I got the Audacity software and I just recorded a sentence like, "Oh, I just recorded something." That's there's that. And then, you know, I think, uh, I also think Pat Flynn, the Pat Flynn podcast. Oh yeah. He has got a lot of very, very good, 
uh, advice. It's very structured and it's very helpful. And even though I still think you have to start to know, like he can give you a really good idea about what steps you need to take. I mean, it's almost like cookie cutter. I mean, it's really black and white. Oh yeah. I wouldn't say I followed his method completely, but I certainly leaned on it in certain areas. Yeah. He was my first uh, mentor when we started. Actually, I started the blog two years before the podcast and Pat Flynn, I followed him for a year. I still do. You know, he's the smart passive income blog, right? He's, yeah. But he's a cool guy. I met him. He's super transparent. That's what it gave when I first got into this online stuff. I was like, wow, this guy is totally transparent. And he's not like a, you know, kind of a weird. He's great. Snake. Yeah. Sort of thing. So Pat's awesome. There's a bunch of guys like that out there, which is cool. One question to wrap this up here was the Warthog. Just kind of going back to that, Roy, that's kind of interesting name. Is there a, um, like, how does that name, what is that about? Um, the Warthog is not very pretty. Uh, it is not very sexy, but nobody messes with the Warthog. It's down in the mud. It's in the mud hole. It's in the dirt. It's not flying high and fast, but everybody respects it. And it's tough. I don't know. <laughs> Right, right. It's a warthog. God, that's crazy. Yeah, it is literally. I don't even know. We'll have to look at what a warthog, the life history of that animal. But yeah, I got you. Down and dirty, right? Somebody's got to do the job. That's right. All right, Jason. Well, uh, anything else you want to give a shout out before we head out of here? I think um, this has been like, like always, I, I enjoy every one of these. You know, people listening now, you've got a lot of stuff going on. What would you give them if you had one call to action right now? Something they could do maybe is that go take a look at your art, go take a look at the podcast. What word you send them? Uh, just if they go to wadeoutthere.com, you know, wade out there, like wade in the river out there with two T's, wadeoutthere.com. And if you're interested in any of that stuff, shoot me a line or subscribe or, you know, buy some art or whatever you want to do. Just I've got the podcast and the art and the blog is all there. So yeah, anything you need can be found there. All the social stuff. Awesome. Well, uh, I'll put links to all this out there in the show notes and, uh, yeah, man, you're doing a good job. I've definitely been, you know, I've heard about you for a while, obviously, but I've been hearing, you know, people are loving your show. So I think you're, you got something good going. So keep it going and appreciate all the time today and uh, definitely keep in touch with you. All right. Thanks, Dave. So there it is. Wetfyswing.com slash 428. 428. You can check it out. I'm sure we are going to have at least one video of the A10 Warthog, some other good stuff there and everything we talked about today. A great opportunity. Quick uh, heads up, uh, we noted this at the beginning, wetflyswing.com slash trips for a chance to uh, just join straight up, join the Steelwater trip. This is going to be Phil Roy, the ultimate Steelwater guru. He is our guy on the littoral zone, and he's going to be up there at the Steelwater School in northern BC at Northern Lights Lodge. This is a amazing remote wilderness uh, lodge, and uh, everything is included, including your drinks. This is going to be a big one. All right, quick listener shout out before we start to head this one out of here. Kyle Halverson. Kyle Halverson sent an amazing, amazing email, um, and it was uh, super long and super amazing. I just want to read a couple of snippets here. Kyle reached out. He said um, he noted how we've been uh, serving all this amazing content, and he really appreciates uh, what we've been doing uh, over the years. Uh, he said, I have fly fished since the early 90s and have tied flies nearly as long. My favorite uh, species morphs constantly. Last fall, I caught my best steelhead ever on a swung intruder. I was ready to forget those little trout uh, for good. Right now, I'm thinking about driftless native brook trout and the wild browns less than an hour away in Wisconsin. I caught a bunch of browns in a new stream last week with Frenchy jigs. This is good. So much good stuff here. I am going to leave it at that. Um, really appreciate this one, Kyle. I'm definitely going to keep in touch with you here and uh, we're going to put together an episode for you as well. We're going to, you got a lot of content here. So this is something I'm going to be digging into. So stay tuned. I see you noted also Ed Ward, uh, the Jerry French episode you loved as well. So we're going to keep that coming and uh, we're going to do our best to, to bring you everything you talked about in your email. If you want to get a shout out on this podcast, you can reach out to me, Dave, at wetflyswing.com anytime or on social. Uh, that's an easy way to connect with me. Let me know if you haven't checked in with me or if it's been a while, just let me know you're still out there listening. Um, that's sometimes the only way I know uh, that you uh, personally are out there, and I'd love to give you a shout out if I can. All right. Uh, so uh, I guess we've already talked about where we're heading a little bit. Um, just let's take a quick peek. So uh, I'm just going to give one shout out to, uh, actually, I'm going to give two shout outs. Tomorrow, we got uh, we got travel coming up with the Snake River Fly. This is a very cool episode. And then Monday, 
the big man, Tim Flagler, is back on the show, and he's going to bring out the, some more of his good goodness. Tim, uh, if you don't know Tim, he's got one of the best and biggest fly tying channels on YouTube and, uh, and just some amazing content. So I'm excited always to get Tim back on the show. And, uh, and I will leave it there for today. I hope uh, you are having a great, uh, a great day right now. And I would really love to catch with you on this Northern Lights Lodge trip. If you can, um, that would be great. Check it out, wetflyswing.com slash trips. Or uh, just connect with me online. I would love that as well. And I'm going to get out of here. I hope you're having a good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever in the world you are. And I appreciate you for stopping in today. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.